Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. Happy New Year. Uh, this is Transitional Justice, and we have with us uh, Paul Namias. He joins us from Stockholm, Sweden. Um, he has come from Tallinn, Estonia. He is based in Istanbul, yeah. Turkey, uh, and he is from Sydney, Australia. You get all that? Write that down, be on a final exam. Uh, <laughs> and he is an international lawyer associated with Project Expedited Justice, Expedited Justice uh, and he does investigations of war crimes. Welcome to the show, Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me here. So uh, tell me what you do uh, for Project Expedite Justice. I'm always interested in investigation of war crimes and, and how you do it and how effective it is. Uh, at the moment, the, the project entails a capa uh, partly capacity development and uh, capacity supplement, uh, given the situation in Ukraine. Um, where every attack constitutes a crime scene. Uh, some At any point, uh, a country, even with the facilities and capacity of Ukraine, uh, can be overwhelmed. So uh, it's uh, essentially trying to uh, teach methodology in terms of documenting the scenes of crimes, amongst other things. Um, that's the most important aspect, uh, because every every attack, every hit, um, needs to be documented properly if they're going to present evidence before a court, either domestically or internationally. And uh, you need a lot more people than uh, what the authorities can provide. Well, you know, investigation goes so slow, you, you wish that it would come to court, uh, that it would result in some, you know, prosecutions, convictions. I, I want you to know, Paul, that I have volunteered and I do volunteer to serve on any jury they may want to select. I'll be there. I I have a few uh, sensibilities I would like to express about this. Yeah, inter international international tribunals and the like uses uh, civil law, so they, they don't use juries. It's uh, it's before judges, but uh, we need witnesses, obviously, and expert witnesses uh, to to present the evidence and uh, and explain the evidence to the to the court to the judges. So um, it, it takes a very long time because of the documentation process. Uh, it takes a very long time to build a case, uh, let alone to hear a case, and then run it through to appeal until all avenues of appeal are exhausted. Um, I don't envisage, based on uh, the history that we've seen with the, um, the tribunals for Rwanda and for Yugoslavia, uh, I would imagine that this would go for about 20 to 25 years uh, if the War II finished tomorrow. Mm. Oh, wow. Is the documentation you're talking about all in English? Largely, well, for, for the uh, International Criminal Court where I used to work, um, most of the cases are put together in English. There are Francophone countries, obviously, where investigations have been conducted where the, the cases are put together in French. Um, for Ukraine, there is a large um, effort to, uh, to conduct it within Ukraine uh, before Ukrainian courts because there's no international tribunal set up at the moment. Even though the International Criminal Court has jurisdiction, um, there are a certain uh, crimes for which the International Criminal Court does not have jurisdiction. The Rome Statute does not cover, for instance, the crime of aggression. Uh, so there's been a, a lot of talk of late in the international community uh, to establish a special tribunal for aggression uh, and based in The Hague. The most recent discussions have been that it would be set up in The Hague based on uh, what's coming from the Dutch government. But uh, I'm, I'm, I haven't really read too much detail into it yet. So you, you talk about other places uh, where there have been war crimes in Africa, for example. Um, have you been involved? What is your experience in this area as an international as lawyer? Crime, crimes against humanity in um, the Cote d'Ivoire uh, and in the Democratic Republic of Congo. You, you've invested. That's my, that's, my, that's my experience, yeah. Mm, okay. So uh, let's, let's move to the news. You know, they say, first the news. Uh, so we have news today about um, an attack um, by the Ukrainians against a, a, a Russian group. And the Times reported that Russia said there were 60-some-odd Russians killed in this attack. Uh, I guess it was in a school or college, and it uh, blew up the building. That's where the Russians were housed. Um, but um, uh, better information, uh, the Ukrainians uh, said that there were several hundred, 400 was reported in the Times. What do you know about this? Um, essentially, what I what I read in the in the press and on the Telegram channels that I subscribe to, 
uh, and, and Twitter feeds that I subscribe to. Um, but it's always the case where, um, in this case, the, the Ukrainian side would say it's a, you know, the casualty level is a lot higher. The Russian side will try and minimize it. I think they've come out and said 60. Um, but uh, some of the chats on the Russian side, internal chats, as well as some comments made by some, let's say, more hardline extremists than the current regime in the Kremlin, uh, have indicated that it's in the several hundred mark. I would think that it would be higher, uh, just just practical experience of following these sorts of exchanges in the past and how it's actually turned out to be. Uh, so I, I would think it would be in the three to 400 level uh, just based on what I've read so far. This is a significant attack. How do the uh, Ukrainians do it? Um, I, I know as much as you do in terms of what I've read. They, um, they, uh, they used HIMARS and, uh, and hit it twice uh, with the facility. Um, and some of the speculation has been that uh, munitions were stored in the same building. Uh, which would be interesting to say the least, but not surprising, um, which resulted in the, the devastation that's been uh, visible in the videos and photos that have, that have been online uh, all, all day today. In a larger sense, what is this attack um, and this number of Russian troops killed? What does that mean to the war? What does it mean to uh, the, the Russian media, to the Russian people? Well, yes, it's a blow. Uh, it's it's a it's a success for the Ukrainian side, I, I would argue. But um, if you're going to argue that this could change the the uh, the outcome of the direction of the war, I, I wouldn't necessarily think so. Uh, they have a lot of mobilised personnel who've been dragged off the streets in various towns and cities. Um, uh, Russia has a very large manpower capacity. I don't think it would make that huge difference. It depends on the sorts of people who were there. Were they officers? Were they you know, well trained with a special forces. I, I don't know, uh, so I, I couldn't. I couldn't speculate either way. Mm. I mean, you know, one thing that occurs to me is, um, you know, with all the news about investigation of war crimes and all the possibility that Russia will be tied up in war crimes trials for decades, um, is is the the intensity of war crimes uh, being committed by the Russians changing in any way? Is it increasing, decreasing, or remaining the same? I don't think it's changed. Uh, I, I don't think that they're being either more careful or, or less careful than they were in the past. Um, again, it's speculative. Uh, there can be an incident which immediately makes one think, oh, it's a crime against humanity, this is a war crime, they've targeted a civilian uh, piece of infrastructure, or whatever it might be, and yet there's legitimate evidence that comes out. Now, I'm speculating here. I'm, I'm not going to refer to anything in Ukraine at the moment, but in other cases... Uh, where it's come out to say, well, they were the other side was using that facility for a military purpose, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it can be a bit hazy. It can't be. It's it's never really as clear cut as um, let's say the viewer might might think. Uh, looking at CNN coverage, say, oh, that's a look. They've hit a school or they've hit a hospital. The other thing is that if they do it by mistake and they conduct an investigation, and there's repercussions for those that were let's say reckless, negligent, or uh, deliberately targeted uh, a hospital or whatever it might be, then it's it, well the war crime is dealt with in their own jurisdiction. So you're not going to go up the chain of command. But where they try and go for a cover up or deny, deny, and obfuscate and and flood the space with disinformation, it makes it much uh, more likely that there would be a large scale investigation into it to look up the chain of command as to why it was done, how it was done. Uh, but again, this is all speculative. We, we're at the stage where the war is ongoing, the incidents continue to pile up, and the crime scenes in each case need to be documented as best possible uh, in very difficult circumstances um, by, uh, in a lot of cases, people who aren't necessarily very well trained in doing it uh, because there's just no, not enough capacity to do it. There's so many, so many crime scenes and only so many detectives uh, able to deploy. So you have to teach people how to do it. You do that? I do it. I have done it. Uh, it, it makes our lives easier when the uh, documentation uh, of, of a scene of a crime such as these uh, is done in a way which is, is more useful to be presented as evidence. Uh, random pictures that don't make it easy to understand where they were taken, when they were taken and by whom uh, are very difficult. A lot of the time we get uh, open source material like this and we spend months if not years trying to verify and trying to trace back to the source of who took that picture and what time was it and we're about and be able to justify it uh, and that's a lot of the a lot of the time of our investigative work is it goes into that
How do you feel about this work, Paul? I mean, are you committed for the duration? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Great. So let's move on to the technology we were going to talk about. Uh, my very rudimentary understanding is that the Ukrainians have an app, a smartphone app, which somehow tells them when a Russian missile is heading their way. Uh, tell us about that. There are several. There are many. Um, many of them are downloadable uh, on iOS or Android um, app stores, uh, depending on your uh, geographic location. For instance, with some of them, I had to create an iTunes account based in Ukraine to be able to download a few of them. Um, there's one in particular which just got an update, which has Mark Hamill's voice in it, telling you that there's an error, error alarm and to go to the nearest shelter and take it seriously and the like, um, which was being promoted earlier last month. So, uh, but that's not available outside of Ukraine. Now, these uh, uh, receive information are from the Ministry of Defence, um, and um, based on your region, the uh, the location in Ukraine, you can set it to the region that you're in. You can pick many regions, uh, leave it on, and it uh, receives the signal, and the siren goes. Now, when I've, in times when I've been in Ukraine, this has woken me up at five in the morning, and I've gone straight downstairs as quick as possible in, in pajamas without any supplies. Uh, and uh, after you know, uh, having been in Ukraine uh, since then, people have become more accustomed to how much time they have, um, as as has been discussed in, in circles within Ukraine. When the message comes, we have about half an hour, as I was told in the last case, where there was an air alarm at 8 o'clock in the morning. It's okay, you've got half an hour. You can grab a coffee, grab your stuff, 15 minutes, go down to the shelter. And we did. Uh, and that was in early December, and there was uh, some 40-odd rockets, 40-odd uh, missiles that were launched at Kiev. Most, uh, all of them, but three were intercepted by uh, air defence and three hit various points of uh, the electrical infrastructure and energy infrastructure of the city on the day, and the air raid lasted about four hours. But the, the confidence in which uh, people who are living in Ukraine and working in Ukraine and Ukrainians that I deal with in terms of how to deal with these air alarms. Yeah, it's all right. You don't have to run straight down. It's fine. Which app do you have? Oh, I've got this one and this one and this one. Oh, yeah, they're good. That's all right. You're good. I've got five of them um, on, uh, on my phone at the moment. And uh, when I leave Ukraine, sometimes I forget to turn them off and at three in the morning, it wakes up myself and my wife and my wife is very upset. And I, <laughs> but it's, it's actually, well, I actually make a point of leaving it on because it kind of, kind of brings it home. I, I don't stay in Ukraine for very long periods of time. Uh, we go for like a week to 10 days at a time, then leave and then go back. And when I'm outside the country, it's easy to kind of lose the feel. Um, so when the alert goes off and I'm out having dinner with friends and it makes me seem a bit weird, I think, okay, this is what everybody I work with and I, everybody I know in Kiev and Kiev and everywhere else is dealing with right now. Some, some questions about how this works. So uh, it's really remarkable that you would have half an hour's notice. Um, for incoming. Uh, that's quite amazing. So that I can't that... say that that's scientific. I can just tell you that that's what the yeah. people I've been working with and dealing with in Ukraine and, and, and Kiev in particular have told me. How does it work? How does the system uh, get the data? Can you talk about it? How it get, Well, the data is provided by the Ministry of Defense. Um, how the Ministry of Defense gets the information is in the realm of speculation. And you could argue that they receive intelligence from their own sources and maybe other sources. Uh, most of the time it's a case where um, planes have taken off at a Russian base or in Belarus or missiles have been launched from a ship in the Black Sea or the Caspian Sea. And that's what's always said. That's what shows up uh, in the details of the app because in some of the apps you can look it up and say you know, what it relates to. It's like, oh, no, there's and people have been around reading it. Some of it's in English, most of it's in Ukrainian. Uh, missiles have been launched from you know, th three ships in the Caspian. Really? It's like, yeah, we've got we've got about twenty minutes to half now. Well, but it, 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 it's not all that geographic. Then, in other words, if you know the missile has been launched, you don't necessarily know where it's pointed. No, exactly, uh, exactly. Um, but the the app actually highlights. There's a map where different regions of Ukraine start to change color in terms of the intensity of the alert, of the alert uh, for particular regions. And sometimes it's it's weird because it's it's like regions across the country, and then Kiev is just white, and you think, okay, so Kiev is okay, oh, not anymore. Then it changes, so it just slowly changes. As soon as the air raid hits, it's normally in multiple regions, not just one, uh, and then it, it comes across. And and in most cases where I've been there, and we've had an air alarm, it's been the whole country. It's just gone red. 
So they don't know necessarily where it's going to go. And more often than not, the the, the drones or the, or the missiles are aimed at various targets across the country. Um, one of the apps here, which is only available in Ukraine, is called Air Alert. Um, so I had to set up an iTunes account in Ukraine to be able to download it. Uh, and recently they provided an update, uh, which you can test the volume. Uh, if I press this here and I touch this. Attention, air raid alert. Proceed to the nearest shelter. Don't be careless. Your overconfidence is your weakness. And a very confident Mark Hamill uh, in the English version telling us what we should do. So, so is it the, the color changes depending on the level of yeah. the threat? Yeah, it does. There's, there's like a light pink and then it goes deeper red and then burgundy when it's uh, full alert. And there's also some indications where uh, air defense has fired at something. So something's been seen. So you'll see this little icon show up in a particular region saying, yep, there's something that's confirmed here and confirmed there and confirmed there, depending on the app. Mm. Um, some apps are better than others, but uh, I think people just you know, have two or three that they use and, and that's it. Two or three. Uh, can oh, yeah. I use them all at the same time? If I, believe, if I turn them all on, on, four or five, whatever it may be, I'll be beeping and booping <laughs> from five different apps. What how does that Believe work? it or not. Believe it or not, yes, but you, you do isolate it to a region. Like the ones I have uh, let you pick the region that you're in, um, and, and that's a lot better. I don't, I don't want to have multiple regions. So if I'm in one part of Ukraine, I make sure that I've got the air alert, uh, air alert uh, region set to that. I go to bed, my phone's on the, on the charger with a battery through the battery, so at least if there's no power, my phone will still be charged. Um, yes, the signal could, could go. Uh, I do with Wi-Fi, and I use the 3G, and then gets the signal and if, if my window is double glazed and I can't hear the siren outside, which happens most often with, with hotels in Kiev, uh, the phone will go within a minute of the sirens blaring in, um, in, in the city. The, the most recent one, I think it was December, what was it December 12th or 13th, um, I could hear the sirens outside because I had the window open and I thought, is this a test because my phone's not going yet? I started to get my stuff ready and then my phone started blaring. It took about 30 seconds. Mm. I was like, all right, I think I've got some time. I'll just, you know, I'll grab hot water, pour it in the coffee, grab all my stuff, go downstairs, go down to the bunker and take my computer and work there. And people do, and people do. And they're just, they just roll with the punches. And it's an incredible place uh, to experience human resilience. You know, we've seen that increasingly, and it's increasingly impressive to recognize that even when your infrastructure is being destroyed, where you're under constant threat, people are so resilient, so strong, so courageous. And can you talk about that uh, as a, a phenomenon? Yeah, I, I can. I mean, uh, I grew up learning history and reading about the, the Battle of Britain and the Blitz and, and how the British people were so resilient and it didn't matter how many buildings were destroyed in London or Coventry or Manchester or Birmingham or whatever it might be. The next day, they just get up and keep, keep going, you know, carry on. And, uh, and, you haven't seen in larger cities of Kiev the same level of devastation. It's not saturation bombing yet. I don't think the Russians had the capacity. If they did, they probably would do it. Um, but uh, but you see the same kind of spirit. Uh, so where at the beginning it might have been a shock. I wasn't there. But by the time I started traveling to Ukraine, all I see is a very resilient, courageous, tough as nails people. They are not going to give up. And you could just knock everything down around them. They will not give up. Oh, that's they roll with the punches. Great it's hear. it's touching. It really is touching. I I feel almost embarrassed that I'm just there briefly and you know living sort of living through it with them, and I get to go home. And I just count down the days, and then I go home. Um, and yet I go home, and my alarm starts blaring because I forget to turn it off, and I think, oh, everyone is being pounded again now. It's like it, it brings it home. Well, yeah, let's talk about that. So, so if I go back to, I don't know, say Cincinnati, and I download one of these apps or a number of them, I'm going to be able to get the same signal that you would get in Kiev, right? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. You set the region as Kiev, and when there's a, an alarm for Kiev, it'll go. And if you, if, you, if you can download the one that you need the Ukrainian store for, you'll have Mark Hamill's voice telling you in English, if you choose English, uh, to get down to the shelter, take it seriously, not to be laughed at. 
Uh, and they're becoming better and better. And the last trip to Kiev that I did, uh, it wasn't a case of, oh, it's only an air alarm, it should be okay. It's like, no, they're getting more and more accurate when it rings. Take it seriously. Yeah. Well, what about that? You, so you go downstairs with your cup of coffee, what have you, um, and you're in the basement um, of, a, of a given building where you know, you're working or living. Um, how safe are you uh, in the basement? Well, I like, to, I like to think that we're very safe. Um, it, it's, it's all that there is. Uh, when we were working in, a, in the offices of a law firm, Everybody had to walk down 12 flights, 15 flights of stairs down to the basement, and there were workstations set up. And it's, it's like the bottom level of the basement uh, you know, car parking storage area. It's about three levels underground in that case. I felt safe. I and mean, if the whole building collapses, I think we should be okay. The likelihood of the whole building being struck and, and collapsing is pretty low. Uh, but I felt safe, and everyone was just carrying on with business. It's not it, it, for us. It was weird because it was new for us, but for them, it had been going for six months already. Uh, they've got their workstations out. There's internet. Um, they've, they've, there's power and there's generators in most of these large buildings. So I've been lucky. And for people living in the outskirts of the major cities in small apartment blocks, they don't have that facility, right? So they're in much, much more difficult conditions. Um, and and I've barely experienced that, so I, I really can't. You know, claim to say that everybody has it nice and luxurious in some of these buildings. We've been very, very well looked after because of where we've been. Um, but it's not the same for, for you know, people living in, in towns and villages across Ukraine, which are hit just as much. It's extraordinary that, you know, the Ukrainians have found a way to do this. But, of course, the Russians must know about it. Uh, the Russians are trying to somehow sabotage it. They're trying to you know, use countermeasures of some kind? Mm, not that I know of, not that I would think. Uh, it would be uh, really to prevent civilians from being aware, uh, made aware that there's uh, incoming projectiles. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if that would be the best use of their resources, to be frank. Um, I, I, it would, yeah, it would so probably be counterproductive. Defensive, it's a defensive device is what it is. Yeah. And do you want to hit? Do you want to hit civilians by surprise? I mean, they're already, let's say, they're already committing some some pretty grievous acts. Um, they, there's not much they can do if it, if it's reliant on on you know satellite you know, picking up their planes taking off from various air bases or missiles being launched from ships in the Caspian or the Black Sea or wherever it might be. Uh, that's going to be detected. If that information is detected, it's going to be passed on. The Ministry of Defence is going to send it out, and and people are going to know. We don't know where it's going, but it's coming. Mm-hmm. Well, but you know, uh, you you talk about uh, you know have cell phones, and I think you mentioned that even when you and when you have the uh, infrastructure being you know damaged, destroyed by Russian missiles, you still have a way to charge your cell phone. Um, you still have a way to get cell cell signals, and for that matter, uh, internet signals. How is that point. possible? In a, in a country that's under attack this way. Well, to a point, it's suffered a lot. I mean, there's days when we've been in, in Ukraine where we haven't had any signal because it was after that, that attack. Uh, it was on, I think it was on a Friday. Um, you know, I, couldn't, I couldn't call the driver to tell him that we were waiting outside in the, in the snow to come and pick us up. The signal was just dead. Uh, we went to a meeting and our counterparts couldn't make it, obviously. They were stuck in traffic. There was no communication, so nobody went to their offices and nobody could tell us that they couldn't come, uh, which was fine for us. We, would, we just wanted to stay committed to have the meeting with them. Um, and then there was no way to notify the driver to come and pick us up. And we've got to go and find the guy. He couldn't park in front. And that's you know, first world problems. I mean, they, they, these people are putting up with this day in, day out. And, uh, and there are little stations here and there in the major cities. And uh, we've seen them. You go and warm up a bit and you can charge your phones. There's generators running in some cafes uh, in, in various places that have power and people can go in and charge their phones. You don't have to be a customer necessarily. And there's a, there's a great deal of solidarity there amongst, uh, amongst Ukrainians and, and it's wonderful to see. Um, but I, I just keep thinking about how much more difficult it is in smaller regional areas which don't have those resources. I, and people are coming together and you hear stories about it and they do what they can. They're not left out. But... I mean, I've really only experienced it passing through and seeing the best uh, of what they have. Yeah, coming together is the operative term here. You have to you have to collaborate to do this project in the first place between you know the intelligence and the civilian communication. 
and to have the cell phones working and to have the whole system working and that be able to charge them. It's, there's a lot of people collaborating to make this happen. But, you know, it does raise the question of how in the world did these apps get built in the first place? Who built oh, them? Whose idea is it? Underestimate. It's don't underestimate Ukrainian IT capacity. Just don't. I think the biggest mistake that we did, and I, I dare say I'm probably in there because I didn't know that much about Ukraine. I read about it. I knew their presidencies. I, I, I knew a little bit a little bit about their politics back since the 90s, but it's not. It wasn't a country that I visited, and I think I very very heavily mis- I underestimated um, their capacity and 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 what kind of country it is. Uh, it's no Russia, and this is this is a country with a massive capacity, very well educated population. Um, my wife works for an American company. Their entire IT division is in Ukraine. Uh, Ukrainians work remotely in IT. I think in much much higher numbers than any other any other country. It's it's not just uh, isolated to that one company. So uh, I'm not even surprised, not even remotely surprised, how advanced Ukraine is. That's extraordinary. But let me add that, uh, you know, ThinkTech, ThinkTech Hawaii, the, the platform you're on right now, we use a lot of software. And we do have one company in Ukraine, in Kiev, that uh, supplies us with certain software products, which I think is really incredible. And they have been, you know, from the time this all started till now, they've been functioning. And they're, you know, a player on the, on the competitive global stage of their particular specialty. And you say, my goodness gracious, how do they do that? What is it in the culture? You, you spoke of education and you, you spoke of resilience. Uh, um, there's more than that, though. It's kind of this, uh, it's a clever thing happening here. Um, where, where does the culture take us, the people who will develop software like this and systems like this, even in the face of, a, of an invasion? I, I, I really don't know. In terms of like getting get that technical expertise in that field, I can't say that I can attribute it to anything in particular as far as the, the country go and it goes and its people uh, and their resilience. Uh, they've, they've had a very difficult history uh, in the last hundred years and then some. Um, I'm sure you're aware of the famine, uh, right? Uh, the Holodomor? Yes. So, 1933. Uh, yes, Stalin, that's yes. Uh, yeah. Exactly. So that that's in their psyche. Uh, I think there's this. Uh, they talk about this in relation to the Holocaust. Um, a genetic memory. There's there's something in their national psyche uh, to be able to withstand these kinds of difficulties and adversities and and come together. And now they've got their freedom. They've had their freedom for thirty years, and they're not going to give it up for anything. Um, and, and they'll do whatever it takes. Uh, I, 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 they never ceases to astound me, and I think it's because I underestimated the country before I, I first went there and was uh, just amazed. The average American didn't know either. He didn't know what was going on oh, in the country. should now. Should now. But the oh, question, I suppose, is whether the Russians know what's going on in Ukraine. I was telling you that there was a 60 Minutes uh, <clears throat> segment uh, a, a day or two ago um, talking about Radio Free Europe, and it's not just radio, it's, it's TV also, uh, broadcasting Western news, and, and it's, it's got an open editorial policy. It's, it's not con- controlled by any government um, uh, of you know, feeding news into the Russian population. And they have millions of viewers and listeners in Russia who are listening. So query, you know, do the Russians get this? Do they understand what's happening? I mean, already you talk about uh, um, IT professionals. Well, a lot of IT professionals have left Russia, hundreds of thousands, they say. Um, And the people inside Russia, maybe they don't get it yet, but certainly Radio Free Europe should be affecting public opinion. Does the average Russian understand what's going on? Well, I think what you've mentioned probably addresses part of it. uh, I'm not sure what the, the... Uh, audience for Radio Free Europe, Free Europe would be in Russia, but so many professional, educated Russians have left. I mean, if you walk around my neighbourhood in Istanbul, I never used to hear Russian, and now that's all I hear. And they are everywhere, uh, everywhere, hundreds of thousands of them, because there's only a few countries that Russians can go to without visas, and one of them is Turkey, and it's Dubai, Thailand to a point, Georgia. I'm not sure if Georgia is still accepting them, but they're still flooding into Turkey, um, either either 
on the way to Europe because there's no flights between Russia and Europe or to stop in Turkey because they can't go anywhere else. And they're the people who read the foreign press. They're the re- people who, who speak foreign languages and can understand and maybe get a better inkling as to what's actually going on. Others within Russia, uh, if they don't have the means, I would imagine that it's just easier not to believe it and just to take the cool aid. Even if they, sh- they would know better and could know better and do know better, it's just easier to, ro- to, to just go along with it because they've got to live there. You think that's changing? I don't think so. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that um, people who expect that the Russian people will suddenly rise up, or at least the Russian people who remain in Russia will rise up, it's not going to happen. Uh, but, but I hope to be proven wrong. Um, if anything, it will be something within the internal hierarchy in the Kremlin, uh, in regions. Um, if some regions start to get a little bit edgy and, and certain governors of certain regions decide they want more autonomy or more independence and now's the time to, to break away and take advantage of the situation, then maybe it'll create a domino effect. I and mean, then we can only hope, well, uh, what kind of instability will result from a breakup of the Russian Federation? I don't know. At the moment, I just want this war to finish and I want Ukraine to win uh, and then we'll deal with Russia. Uh, but priority one is, is that. Speak for all of us, Paul. Uh, Paul Namias, uh, Project Expedite Justice, talking to us from Stockholm, uh, but that doesn't mean he's going, he's not going back to <laughs> Ukraine anytime soon. He'll be back. Uh, and he also spends time in, in Tallinn, uh, uh, Estonia, just sort of in the middle between Stockholm and Ukraine. Thank you very much, Paul, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, Please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.